Section two of the New Life, La Vita Nuova. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mary J. The New Life, La Vita Nuova, by Dante Alighieri, translated by Dante Gabriel Rossetti. Section two. From that night forth, the natural functions of my body began to be vexed and impeded for I was given up wholly to thinking of this most gracious creature, whereby in short space I became so weak and so reduced that it was irksome to many of my friends to look upon me, while others, being moved by spite, went about to discover what it was my wish should be concealed. Wherefore I, perceiving the drift of their unkindly questions, by love's will, who directed me according to the counsels of reason, told them how it was love himself who had thus dealt with me. And I said so, because the thing was so plainly to be discerned in my countenance that there was no longer any means of concealing it. But when they went on to ask, And by whose help hath love done this? I looked in their faces smiling, and spake no word in return. Now it fell on a day that this most gracious creature was sitting where words were to be heard of the Queen of Glory, and I was in a place whence mine eyes could behold their beatitude, and betwixt her and me, in a direct line, there sat another lady of pleasant favor, who looked round at me many times, marveling at my continued gaze, which seemed to have her for its object, and many perceived that she thus looked, so that departing thence I heard it whispered after me, Look you to what a pass such a lady hath brought him, and in saying this they named her who had been midway between the most gentle Beatrice and mine eyes. Therefore I was reassured, and knew that for that day my secret had not become manifest. Then immediately it came into my mind that I might make use of this lady as a screen to the truth, and so well did I play my part, that the most of those who had hitherto watched and wondered at me now imagined they had found me out. By her means I kept my secret concealed till some years were gone over, and for my better security I even made diverse rhymes in her honor, whereof I shall here write only as much as concerneth the most gentle Beatrice, which is but a very little." Moreover, about the same time while this lady was a screen for so much love on my part, I took the resolution to set down the name of this most gracious creature accompanied with many other women's names, and especially with hers whom I spake of. And to this end, I put together the names of sixty of the most beautiful ladies in that city where God had placed mine own lady, and these names I introduced in an epistle in the form of a servant, which it is not my intention to transcribe here. Neither should I have said anything of this matter did I not wish to take note of a certain strange thing, to wit, that having written the list, I found my lady's name would not stand otherwise than ninth in order among the names of these ladies. Now it so chanced with her by whose means I had thus long time concealed my desire that it behoved her to leave the city I speak of, and to journey afar, wherefore I, being sorely perplexed at the loss of so excellent a defense, had more trouble than ever I could before have supposed, and thinking that if I spoke not somewhat mournfully of her departure, my former counterfeiting would be the more quickly perceived, I determined that I would make a grievous sonnet thereof, the which I will write here, because it hath certain words in it whereof my lady was the immediate cause, as will be plain to him that understands. And the sonnet was this. All ye that pass along love's trodden way, pause ye a while and say, if there be any grief like unto mine, I pray you that hearken a short space, patiently, if my case be not a piteous marvel and a sign. Love, never, certes, for my worthless part, but of his own great heart, vouchsafed me to a life so calm and sweet that oft I heard folk question as I went what such great gladness meant. They spoke of it behind me in the street, but now that fearless bearing is all gone, which with love's hoarded wealth was given me, till I am grown to be so poor that I have dread to think thereon. And thus it is that I, being like as one who is ashamed and hides his poverty, without seem full of glee, and let my heart within travail and moan. This poem has two principal parts. For, in the first, I mean to call the faithful of love in those words of Jeremias the prophet, O vos omnes qui transitis per viam, attendite et videte si es dolor sicut dolor meus, and to pray them to stay and hear me. In the second, I tell where love had placed me, with a meaning other than that which the last part of the poem shows, and I say what I have lost. The second part begins here. Love never certes. A certain while after the departure of that lady, it pleased the master of angels to call into his glory a damsel, young and of a gentle presence, who had been very lovely in the city I speak of, and I saw her body lying without its soul among many ladies, who held a pitiful weeping. Whereupon, remembering that I had seen her in the company of excellent Beatrice, I could not hinder myself from a few tears, 
and weeping i conceived to say somewhat of her death and guerdon of having seen her some while with my lady which thing i spake of in the latter end of the verses that i writ in this matter as he will discern who understands and i wrote two sonnets which are these one weep lovers sith love's very self doth weep and sith the cause for weeping is so great when now so many dames of such great estate and worth show with their eyes a grief so deep for death the churl has laid his leaden sleep upon a damsel who was fair of late defacing all our earth should celebrate yea all save virtue which the soul doth keep now hearken how much love did honour her i myself saw him in his proper form bending above the motionless sweet dead and often gazing into heaven for there the soul now sits which when her life was warm dwelt with the joyful beauty that is fled this first sonnet is divided into three parts in the first i call and beseech the faithful of love to weep and i say that their lord weeps and that they hearing the reason why he weeps shall be more minded to listen to me in the second i relate this reason in the third i speak of honour done by love to this lady the second part begins here when now so many dames the third here now hearken two death all we cruel pity's foe in chief mother who brought forth grief merciless judgment and without appeal since thou alone hast made my heart to feel this sadness and unweal my tongue upbraideth thee without relief and now for i must rid thy name of ruth behoves me speak the truth touching thy cruelty and wickedness not that they be not known but ne'er the less i would give hate more stress with them that feed on love and very sooth out of this world thou hast driven courtesy and virtue dearly prized in womanhood and out of youth's gay mood the lovely lightness is quite gone through thee whom now i mourn no man shall learn from me save by the measure of these praises given whoso deserves not heaven may never hope to have her company the poem is divided into four parts in the first i address death by certain proper names of hers in the second speaking to her i tell the reason why i am moved to denounce her in the third i rail against her in the fourth i turn to speak to a person undefined although defined in my own conception the second part commences here since thou alone and the third here and now for i must and the fourth here who so deserves not end of section two